we don't want to punish people for driving, but we need to normalize not driving as a viable and pleasant option. You know, that, that, that's what's going to get people to do it. It's like if riding a bike or walking or, or catching public transport is as pleasant as driving is or inconvenient as driving is, then people will do it. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Simmerman and that is Chris Cox from Brisbane, Australia. Uh, Chris is a local advocate for safer cycling facilities and uh, has a YouTube channel as well. And he had a YouTube video that uh, went viral a few months back and I asked him if he wouldn't uh, mind coming on the podcast to talk a little bit about it. And that is what this is. So without further ado, let's get right to it with Chris Cox. Chris Cox, it's so wonderful to have you here on the Active Towns podcast. Welcome. Thanks, John. Great to be here. So, Chris, I love having my uh, guests sort of introduce themselves uh, and and give a little bit of a background. Uh, so, you know, tell us who you are and where you're from. Cool. Well, I um, I'm from Brisbane in Australia. Um, I'm an IT analyst project manager, so I'm not particularly um, in the profession of urban planning or anything, but. Um, I began riding a bike to work about 10 years ago when I realized I was just driving my car to the train station and, and back every day. And that was all it was for. So, so that got me started. And since then, you know, there were some things that happened, uh, some people that uh, some crashes happened and things like that, which, um, sort of motivated me to advocate more because I really enjoyed, um, my experience riding to work, but wasn't terribly good for, for other people. And I wanted other people to have the opportunity. So um, I got heavily involved in some community advocacy. I run the uh, Brisbane West Bicycle User Group, which is a community advocacy group in the western suburbs of Brisbane. Uh, and we sort of have formed a Space for Cycling Brisbane campaign across other bugs across Brisbane um, to try and push that message to you know encourage the city to, to build more active transport. I even dipped my, my feet into some politics briefly. I, I ran as the Queensland Senate candidate for the Australian Cyclist Party in 2016. So had a bit of a experience sort of trying to um, get into that, that realm and it was a bit of fun. So um, yeah, I've got three kids and a wife and we, we live in the western suburbs of Brisbane. And try, I try to live a, a, a car light lifestyle, which uh, can be challenging in a very car centric city like Brisbane. So um, I guess that's me in a bit of a nutshell. Fantastic. That's great. I, I love the fact that there, what was the, the party name that you ran on the ticket? The, the, Austra the Australian Cyclist Party. So um, they, they formed uh, oh, a, bit, a bit over 10 years ago. Yeah. To try and <laughs> yeah, push that, that active travel across, across Australia. Um, All right, they, so they, I've, since... I've, I've got our, I've got our uh, map here of, uh, of Brisbane and I'm going to zoom out so we can uh, sort of orient uh, since we, we've got an international audience here. And, and as I was mentioning to you before we hit the record button, I've never been to Australia. I really need to get there. I've been on that side of the world before. I, I, I lived in the Philippine Islands for an entire year, uh, but that was way back in the 80s. So I definitely need to get back uh, to that side of the world and I need to get uh, over to uh, Australia and, and check it out. Um, I, I mentioned to you also before we hit record that I'm a surfer. So uh, I, I would love to go check out uh, some of the surf spots in the Gold Coast, which we're starting to zoom in on here. And uh, yeah, and so you, you mentioned that you're sort of in the, the western suburbs, uh, and as we kind of get in here, let's see if we yeah. can find your spot again. Boom, warmer, boom, boom. warmer, yeah, <laughs> up warmer. a little bit, <laughs> zoom in, zoom in, there up a little is. bit, yeah, so, so um, up a bit higher, sorry, so Jindalee. It's a little higher. It's near the top of the screen, yeah, there you go, oh, there so it is. it's Jindalee, Jin so. Jindalee, there we are. Yeah, so we're, we're about... About 15 kilometers from Brisbane CBD, um, yeah. which at the time is where I was working. So I was, as I said, I, I was driving five kilometers to the, to the nearest train station with our second car and catching right. the train to work and back every day. And I started thinking, well, what's the, what's the point of this second car? Maybe I can just ride to the train station. And, yeah. Um, so, and, and, and folks yeah, who are looking map. at this map going, what's all this green uh, here? The, so this is Google Maps, and, and I've got the, uh, the filter for the bike routes uh, turned on. And so these are the, uh, uh, these are the bike lanes, the bike paths. Uh, and then when you see sort of dotted lines, that means it's theoretically a, uh, a bicycle-friendly street. 
Um, but you'll notice that not all of the residential streets have that indication, which we can talk about a little bit because I think that the cities um, could benefit from the fact that many of the quiet residential streets are just like they're invisible. They, they don't have, you know, any, an indication that, you know, uh, so long as there's enough traffic calming and the speeds aren't too great there, uh, more than likely, you know, many of these streets that are, are right next to streets that have the da- dashed line are probably quite comfortable to ride on. So, yeah. Yeah. Ab- yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. And, and I'm sure we'll talk about uh, the 30 kilometer uh, per hour uh, campaign. And, and I think that that's, that's part of the relevance to what we're just talking about here is that, you know, if these streets in this, in these residential areas were, uh, had a, a, a 30 kilometer per hour, uh, you know, designation, then um, inherently, especially if you can also couple that with some permeability and some other traffic calming features to it, suddenly you're you're able to really open up a tremendous amount of real estate uh, for people to to ride. So, I'm, again, I'm yeah, hundred sure percent. We'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that. But before we do that. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that caught my eye um, from way back when uh, it, it had to have been like, you know, four months or so ago uh, was that uh, you started to trend a little bit on Twitter. And it was all because of this uh, this video that you produced. And by the way, we didn't mention that. No, Chris we didn't Cox. mention my YouTube channel. Yeah, I'm, your YouTube I'm, ter- channel. I'm terrible, so, at, terrible at selling my YouTube yeah, channel. So, so let's get let's get all over here. So here here you are. Here's uh, Coxie's Gone Riding, uh, the YouTube channel. Take us back to nine years ago. I mean, you've got a you've got a thirty thousand k, you know, <laughs> you've got a 30,000 30, views on your nine year old uh, video here on Cleat Fail. Um, Talk a little bit about your YouTube channel, why you started originally, and uh, what it's sort of evolved into over the years. Yeah, well, I mean, early on in my time writing to work, I was having a few, you know, incidents and things, and and I was a little bit concerned about my safety. So I, I invested in a, a cycling camera, which I can't even remember the, the make of it now. It wasn't a GoPro. I didn't have that kind of money back then for that. Um, and so I just started a YouTube channel just to upload some of the clips and um, share my frustration with fellow cyclists on <laughs> around the place. Um, so yeah, it, it was usually just clips about things I'd seen, you know, some silly driving or whatever. And I don't know what it is about that video, but I was just stuck behind a, a guy with, um, cleat pedals. He just couldn't get them in. Um, and when you're riding in a, in an urban environment with lots of traffic lights, you stop start a lot. It, it was, um, very noticeable. So, um, you know, back then I didn't wear cleats at all. I, I have moved on. I do have cleats now. Um, but yeah, so for, for riding and, and to work, I was just like, well, wh- why would you bother with that stuff? It just seems to be more of a hassle. Um, but yes, anyway, so that video seemed to have yeah. clicked with people. I think that there's always that debate, you know, should I get cleats? Should I not? So people yeah. are looking for evidence why and why not. So yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, Sort of the the active town's position on it is we're we're pretty agnostic in terms of different types of bikes. We're just like, hey, if you're riding, that's fantastic. Get out and ride, and exactly. you know we don't get get too hung up into the other stuff. Um, but ninety percent of the time when I'm riding, you know I'm I'm riding from the house down to the downtown area, either for meetings or meeting up with folks, uh, head down for coffee or something like that, or or head to the grocery store. And so 90% of the time I'm on either my uh, electric assist cargo bike or I'm on my, uh, my, my priority 600, um, you know, bike that has uh, a really nice pinion uh, gear shifting system and uh, just a super smooth, smooth ride, but also very Dutch like very upright bike. And, and I just wear my normal clothes and I don't wear a helmet. And, you know, I try to humanize that interaction as much as possible i don't want it to look like i'm um you know somebody doing something special Mm, you know in terms of like kitting out and wearing my 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 cleats and and all that sort of stuff which i do have on my racing bike which when i get out and, and do that or i have special mountain biking shoes when i'm out on my mountain bike and 
getting out into the single track and all that sort of stuff, very technical areas. But uh, for the most part, it's just like, yeah, it's super, super chill. And yeah, I wouldn't wear cleats for going to <laughs> get coffee no. or go, going to the grocery store. That would just make it inconvenient. <laughs> So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've got um, they're these Shimano casual type cleat shoes. So the cleats yeah. are embedded and I can just sort of, I can walk around and they don't click clack, which is nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, same. Often I've got um, meetings. We, we've got a um, an active travel advisory committee group, which is sort of a combined state and local government committee and stakeholders that we meet every yeah. quarter. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if I'm, if I'm writing to that, I'll, I'll just write in, you know, smart casual business clothes with yeah. flat shoes and because you want to look like well hang on this is just for every everyday people this is that's right you know, yeah it, it you know cycling isn't you know a hardcore activity it's just a, a way to get from a to b so yeah, yeah. so yeah you know pe- pe- people people can wear what they like unfortunately in, in brisbane and australia helmets aren't an option um we have a mandatory <laughs> helmet law here and yeah, you you, yeah. you risk a it's a 143 dollar fine at the moment if you pinged with that one so yeah and if and if i recall i I'll, I'll i'll get over here to this this view for just a second as i recall when i interviewed mark von Ge- von, <laughs> mark Wagenberg, sorry mark um with bicycle dutch i think it was brisbane where what? he was yeah. pulled over by the the uh police and uh, and i saw a post i think earlier today that the brisbane police just are kind of notoriously aggressive and rude to to cycling is, is cyclists is that correct yeah i mean I, i'm necessarily rude or, or not but yeah, um that's yeah that, there's they do blitzes and yeah. they they like they like to target vulnerable road users you know to you know they'll, they'll tackle what you know what americans would call jaywalking you know people right. crossing the road yeah. against red and things like that um and you know there's a particular area where they they do like to to camp out on the bicentennial bikeway it's our main route in from the west into the city and you know they'll they'll pull over every cyclist and they'll be you know checking your helmet they'll be checking your bell because you've got to have a bell as well that's also 143 dollar fine if you don't have a bell on your bike Interesting. And, you know things like that so yeah, yeah i mean it, it's very much a um you know we've got this reputation of being a bit of a laid-back country but we really do love our rules and law enforcement <laughs> yeah well and, and it's not to say that you know the danes and the and the dutch don't have uh you know rules and regulations associated with their bikes they do i mean Absolutely, technically yeah. you're supposed to have a light you know both front and back and i believe you're supposed to have a bell as well um so it's but the aggressiveness is what's really really mind-boggling and like you said you know that that focusing in on on the vulnerable road users and and like blaming the victim kind of mentality is very very concerning yeah absolutely and, and we you know we, we have a, a safe passing law so we've got one meters one meter under 60 kilometers an hour 1.5 meters o- over 70 kilometers an hour but um and theoretically we can send in our video footage to the police and get get action on that um it's like pulling teeth you know yeah. to, to get to get a conviction from that but you know police yeah. will happily you know pick people up for, for not having a bell on their bike or whatever. But, yeah. you know, people, people argue rules are rules. We expect motorists to obey the rules. But I, yeah. I think there's a bit of a, a, a disconnect in perception of risk, you know, like the, right. a cyclist not, work, not having a bell, you know, they're not going to pose the same risk as a motorist that's driving 20 k's over the speed limit. You know right. that kind of thing, yeah. Um, but yeah, it was interesting that that in- incident with with Mark Wagenber. Um, I probably can't say his name right either. I think you um, did okay. Yeah, yeah, it, he, it was he, um, as well as I did. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, he was actually riding with, with a, a mate of mine, Paul, uh, who was okay. showing him around Brisbane. And um, Paul's a, a strong advocate against um, mandatory helmet laws. Um, right. And so, and he's also as, a doctor. As am so, I, by the way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as, look, as, a, as, a, as a public health uh, professional with 30 years experience, I can tell you that uh, that particular law, that particular approach um, does more to prevent people to, you know, to ride. And so, you know, from a v- various different levels, it's friction, but also it sends the wrong message. It sends the message that, um, that, cycling is a dangerous activity and yeah. it's it shouldn't be i mean we've got countries you know, that you know prove that it's not a inherently dangerous activity now 
context sensitive, obviously, if you're, yeah, of course. if you're traveling at 25 miles per hour, you know, whatever that is in kilometers, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, it, that's 40, a yeah. lot, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, use common sense folks, but yeah. Uh, yeah, when we look at the number of people who, um, whose lives would have been saved by the reduction in, you know, healthcare costs and, and all these other factors, not to mention just the, the impact on the environment and everything else. Uh, mm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just doesn't, it doesn't add up from that sense. No, so, it doesn't. And, and, um, yeah. and I haven't got the, 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 the data on me, but um, if you look at the Australian census data for cycling participation, yeah. Um, it dropped off a cliff as soon as the manager helmet law came in. Yeah, in no, and I've seen that in every single municipality and every single state that has done this, it, it, it drops off. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. pretty unambiguous. And we don't need to go into that uh, into no. detail <laughs> because it has been looked at. It's been but done. But it's the second video here, the second highest video of all time, 18,000 views. This is the one that, uh, that really ca captured the attention out on... Um, out on Twitter and, you know, kind of went live. I'm going to play this just a little bit. I want to play the opening at least and, and add the, the video or add the sound to this. All right, let's hit play and turn the volume up. It's already turned up. So I did an interview yesterday with Channel 7 News and it was great stuff. It was, you know, my in-depth analysis about the geopolitical fallout of the federal election and what it means for cycling in Brisbane and particularly the North Brisbane bikeway. We're just so close to getting it done. We just want to see it finished. Yeah, showbiz. <laughs> I love your sense of humor. <laughs> it's yeah, I'm not good at speaking while I'm riding at the same time, so I thought I'd sit down. After the interview finished, I noticed that there was a woman just standing around behind. And when we were done, she came up to the journalist and said, do you want to hear from someone really in the community? And then she, the red flags went off. Although I own a push bike myself. We all know where this is going, right? You know, I'm something of a cyclist myself. As far as an anti-cycling rant goes, it was probably a 11 out of 10. You know, she started off pointing a finger at me saying, they're rude, they're inconsiderate, they're aggressive. If they were black people, they'd be locked up as a criminal gang. Boy, that escalated quickly. So I think she kind of told on herself a bit there, but it just, you know, at the time you just think it's funny. You just laugh, you know, crazy lady. But the problem is... I'm gonna go ahead and pause it here just to, <laughs> to kind of get a reflection. So you put this out there and did you did you think, oh, this thing's gonna go. Like, I mean, the, I, I hit it out of the park on this one. This is this is a really good one. Or were you really surprised by the fact that this traveled around the globe? I was, I was surprised. I mean, I never know what's going to to appeal to people. Some of the stuff that I think is really good doesn't go anywhere. But um, yeah, I think this probably just hit a nerve with people because I think from a cyclist perspective, you know, we've all heard it. We've all heard this same stuff wherever you are around the world. You know, um, anywhere that's not got cycling as part of its inherent transport culture, you know, all, all the same kind of stereotypes and things. But likewise, I think it hit a nerve with people who do have those stereotypes. They're kind of like, yeah, but, but I'm right. So that they, they sort of, they wanted to look in there and they wanted to prove me wrong. You know, well, people hate you because of this. And I said, well, you're just proving my point. Um, you, you, you've got all these examples you've seen. I'm not denying people have probably seen and experienced negative things with cyclists. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's people just then they equate that to everyone. It's that outgrouping mentality that I think is um, so prevalent for some reason, particularly around cycling. Yeah, yeah. So in 2019, a study, you know, out of out of Australia, you know, came up that uh, that basically, you know, came up and said, yeah, we, you know, the way too many drivers see cyclists as literal cockroaches. So this came out in, in spring of, of 2019, I believe, or maybe it was late uh, uh, 2018, but it really hit the presses in, in, um, in the spring of, of 2019. Uh, this particular one is, this particular article is they picked up on the research. Uh, this is Bicycling Magazine, but if you just Google, you'll see that it got picked up by a lot of mm. different outlets. 
And um, what was really, really fascinating about this from a behavior modification perspective and my background of, of encouraging health behavior is perceptions and, and, and the way that, that you know, we're perceived as humans out there in, in space and in the, in the environment. And I mentioned it earlier. One of the things that, one of the reasons why I, you know, choose to ride my bike the way that I do is because I know that eyes are looking at me. I knew, I know that, you know, people are perceiving my activity and they're seeing somebody, oh, you're, he's dressed nicely. He's picking up groceries. He's doing all this other kind of stuff. You know, wow, that's that's cool and he's smiling and he's waving and he's playing you know maybe he's maybe i've got my music going a little bit you know and and you know i'm interacting with kids and and parents and and people who are also out on the street um that makes a difference because that that's you know creates that's what i call humanizing the the street space and humanizing the experience and what they started noticing here was the dehumanization of people, of people who are quote unquote cyclists, people who are riding specifically in in Australia, and uh, and it was interesting too because when they did the the the, the research, um, they used this sort of famous March of Progress chart that you know they kind of adapted that chart that was you know like the man the evolution of man from chimpanzees on, on up to, to human form and they sort of modified that and they used a, a version of it where um you know it's something like this where you know at the bottom end of the scale the zero end of the scale is like a, an insect like a, a a cockroach and then in between um it you know it was like this one kind of looks the one in the middle sort of looks like a praying mantis <laughs> and then and then you're then you get to human form but it, it was interesting in the sense that that 31 percent of respondents rated cyclists as less than human and mm. I, I guess if you flip it around you know it's it's like well okay um th that's only 31 percent but on the other side, that's horrifying. It's 31%. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the majority of people still see us as humans, you know, but mm. at the same time to, to think that a fairly significant percentage of, of people are, are like going, yeah, you know, and when this study came out, I actually was, was thinking about it too. And I was, I started to emphasize one of the recommendations that I've always had, even when I'm on my sport bike and I'm wearing my helmet and I'm wearing my sunglasses. Um, I always try to make sure that if I'm stopping at a, at a corner market or something like that and heading in to get another bottle of water and maybe, you know, maybe a sport drink, maybe a sport bar, you know, or something like that, some nutrition, especially if I'm doing a long ride, like I, I do with my friends when I'm in Colorado, we'll go out for a hundred mile ride. And, um, and so I always try to take the helmet off, the sunglasses off and, and, and try to, to, to make myself look less bug like, Hmm. because that i mean this this study really drove it home for me it's like yeah we kind of do look like insects with our exoskeleton helmet on and our glasses and shields and all this it's like we we kind of and especially if we're traveling in a pack we're like a swarm mm. <laughs> it's like yep. uh, yeah i i kind of get what they're saying so <laughs> all the more reason for me saying you know it's like if if I, it is a situation where i am wearing a helmet and sunglasses i'll take them off to try to rehumanize the experience if i'm having an interaction i'll take the sunglasses off um more often than not i'm just in my normal clothes now so i again 90 95 of the time when i ride i'm just in my normal clothes so anyways mm. thoughts on that what do you what do you yeah. think you're living it you're you're in australia you you i'm sure this hit the airwaves and probably hit home a little bit more so than it did with for us yeah for sure and i think there were a lot of people that were like yeah 
That's right. They are less than human, um, you know, because talkback radio, you, you, you can get some um, interesting people chime in and, and social media comments. But I, I think it, it does just reinforce that the, the challenge here is to normalize cycling um, or people cycling as people who are just using a bike to go from A to B. Um, that's not to dehumanize people that go for long rides. I mean, we, we, we like to do that. But, um, you know, the, the when you've got people that are driving their cars and you, you've got in the back of your head that one in three of them don't really see me as human, so they're not necessarily going to take that much care around me, that that's kind of worrying. Um, and it it probably doesn't play out in that kind of ratio. I, I think I probably have, you know, maybe one in 20 drivers, I think, probably show a bit of um, callous disregard for my welfare. But, yeah, it, it's, it's an interesting one, but I think it's – a sign of also just that we do live in a very car centric um, culture in Australia, you know, right back from world war two, like most of the, you know, um, English speaking countries, it was very much, we went down the path of the car as the future and redesigned our cities to, to do that ripped out trams. We, you know, and, and just the cars plonked in on the streets that at that time people on bikes were, were using. And so they were pushed aside and then, you know, I think in the, in the 1970s, things sort of changed a bit in Europe. That was where, you know, the oil crisis and, and the stop the kinder mort in, in the Netherlands and that led to their cycling network developed. In Australia, we, we sort of, I mean, I wasn't alive in, at, the, at the time of the oil crisis, so I don't necessarily know how much that affected Australia, but we went the other way. Like we really urbanised strongly. In Brisbane, we had an American transport planner, I think his name was Wilbur Smith, who you know, consulted with the, the state government and he designed motorways around the river and through the city, like literally through the city. And, you know, we got rid of the trams. It, it, it was just a, one disaster after another from a planning perspective. But the side effect of that was that cycling to get places just disappeared. And then really, you know, we, we touched on it, but the final nail in that was the helmet law because then suddenly you couldn't be just a normal person on a bike anymore. Right. You had to wear your exoskeleton. That was required by law, right. you know. And so what was left when that happened was that the people that were just, you know, you know, mums riding to, to work and, and kids riding to school, a lot of them stopped and you were left with a really sporting culture so the people that were riding were riding for sport they were already wearing helmets because you know in the 70s and 80s they got developed and it was you know seen as a a safe thing to do so then throughout the 90s and early 2000s that was what a cyclist was so i think that's really led us to this point and and now we're seeing a change you know we're we're seeing a lot more especially now with e-bikes really becoming prevalent you know um when i ride into the city now i'll see way more women my age in work clothes just riding to work on an electric bike and i think you know that's 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 fantastic to see and i think you know we're seeing a lot more cargo bikes although the environment in brisbane doesn't lend itself terribly well to cargo bikes with some of the infrastructure we have pedestrian refuges which are barely wide enough for a pedestrian to stand on so if you've got a cargo bike and you've got to wait in the middle of a road that's um not terribly easy but you know that the Authorities are saying the right things about how, you know, cycling is good, cycling is important, it helps reduce congestion, it's better for public health and that sort of thing. But they're not also, they're, at the same time, they're also trying to continue this car dependence. They're like, we'll get right. you home soon, sooner and safer with more in, with more roads and more lanes and, and all of this, you know, and we don't want to punish drivers for, for choosing to drive. And it's like, you know, we, we don't want to punish people for driving, but we need to normalise not driving as a viable and pleasant option you know that, that that's what's going to get people to do it it's like if riding a bike or walking or, or catching public transport is as pleasant as driving is or inconvenient as driving is then people will do it at the moment for a lot of people it's not and so yeah. we we get stuck with this everyone drives and so then everyone who's not driving is another and i think cyclists sort of are a particular out group that that draws some of that um that angst yeah yeah I'm going to go back to our video here and play uh, the the end uh, of it because I think you you kind of wrap things up nicely and sort of pose a question and uh, I, I, I obviously I'll have the link uh, to the full video um, in the video description in the show notes uh, for for folks who are um, 
or are just listening, I uh, encourage you to, to head on over to the uh, uh, the website for the landing page for this episode. Uh, take a look at the video description. Take a look at the show notes and uh, and uh, give this a listen, but uh, or give it a watch. But uh, let's pull this up and uh, and see how you kind of wrap things up here. Well, to be cut until the next turn. Anyway, it's all very interesting. I don't understand bigotry. Do you have any ideas? If you've got any thoughts about why people think the way they do and how we change it, I would really be open to it. Like, because I don't get it. You know, if you hate cyclists, or you think that we should pay rego, make sure you hit subscribe and hit the notification bell so you get notified when I post a new video and you can tell me how wrong I am. And if you don't think rego is the answer, make sure you hit subscribe and the notification bell so you know when I post a video and you can tell me how right I am. And seriously, if you really do enjoy cycling related videos and movies, make sure you get along to Space for Cycling, Brisbane's Bicycle Film Night 2022. It's on Saturday the 28th of May at the Kangaroo Point Multicultural Centre. And my favourite is the it. Brisbane I Bike Bites it. Short Film Festival. <laughs> Where... How did that event go? Yeah, really good. That's the... Yeah. Um, Oh, I think it's the sixth or seventh. I've lost count. So we yeah. do it as it's our annual um, fundraising event for our Space for Cycling campaign, and um, nice. it, it's really good. So we we always have a feature film. Um, we've had Mother Load previously, which was oh good, yeah, cargo cult culture, uh, cargo bike culture, yeah, not cargo cult. Um, and but we also have a, a short film festival. So people, you know, they write, they make their own films, um, you know, from with a, a general theme of cycling around Brisbane or, or just cycling. And um, some of the people come up with some really creative stuff. I haven't entered it yet. Yeah. I, I feel like a, a bit of a, a fraud filmmaker myself, but um, you know, some of them are, some of them are so good. Um, and yeah, it's a really fun night and it's a, a great way for, I suppose, especially for a lot of cyclists who just, they ride to work by themselves and they sort of feel a bit isolated being yeah. in that, you know, it sort of gives you that feeling of a, a bit of a community. Like you're not alone. There's a lot yeah. of us out there and we're, we're all on the, on the same path here. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I say the same thing about myself. I'm a health promotion professional turned storyteller and I'm just kind of figuring this out as I go along. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, uh, it's all in good fun. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an honor when I'm able to brush shoulders with real, uh, real documentary filmmakers and, and uh, folks that have been doing uh, this gig for, for many, many years, like, like Mark, uh, Mark Wagenberg with uh, Bicycle Dutch and obviously Clarence Eckerson Jr. Uh, with uh, street films. Uh, does Australia have a, a Clarence or a Mark that uh, no. is at that level or, or are you it? Well, I don't know if I'm it, but um, it's one of the reasons that I sort of last year sort of changed a bit of the direction on my YouTube channel and thought, I'm going to actually just make some proper videos that actually touch on issues and, and things a bit more than just showing some clips of bad driving or whatever, because it, it's something that's really lacking in Australia. Like I okay. see, I see not just bikes and oh, the, oh, the, oh, the urbanity and city nerd. And, and yep. there's a lot of these really great channels out there that do some really excellent content, but it's all very, you know, North American focused or European focused. There's, right. Um, there's very little that's touching on Australia. And unfortunately, that sort of feeds into this Australian exceptionalism, which we do have. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, everywhere has it. I mean, honestly, I mean, it, everybody has that sort of orientation of not created here. Therefore, we're going to dismiss anything that's being said. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, like I said, we, we have, you know, I meet often with politicians of, of various um, levels of government and you know you, you push some ideas to to them and they they say oh yeah but we're not the netherlands or we're not london you know yeah. and it's like but you know we're, we're actually probably in, in a lot of ways better positioned to take advantage of our of our climate and environment yeah. to to make that happen yeah. um we just need a bit of political will but um well and i'm glad you said that a little bit of political will. And you also just mentioned that, uh, you know, you've got some pretty good plans and you've got some leadership that are saying some of the right things, but you also have some leadership that are saying some really crazy stuff. So let's let's take a look at uh, this most recent video that you've done. Lord Mayor of Brisbane, Adrian Schrinner, clearly expressed what he thought of evidence-based, globally recognised road safety policies. Isn't democracy a great thing? Batshit crazy ideas get voted down. So recently, Brisbane City Council debated a proposal to establish a default local street speed limit of 30 kilometres per hour. 
The University of Queensland, home of our best and brightest, already has a 30 km per hour speed limit established. Its roads carry thousands of cyclists, pedestrians and motorists every day. Sometimes motorists don't get it right, like this loner. I love this. Oof, yeah. Not a good time to pull out from that parking spot. On a normal 50 km per hour street, that four wheel drive approaching at normal speed, what happens next could have been terrible. But it wasn't. The Lord Mayor isn't a fan. Batshit crazy ideas. Hmm. So comfortable is the batshit crazy 30 km per hour speed limit that a family was happily riding together. Dad, riding with three kids on their own bikes and a fourth in the trailer on their way to swimming lessons. Perfectly safe. Would you be so keen to ride like this on a 50 km per hour local street? Batshit crazy ideas. <laughs> and he goes on and on. Yeah, and yeah, on. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. And that also, by the way, that I also that hit my radar screen too when when he said that, and and it's made the rounds on Twitter as well. So, yeah, um, I mean, it's an interesting thing because, like, this is this is the nature of partisan politics, unfortunately. And so, without delving too much into it, it was proposed by a Green Party councillor. Um, he represents the liberals who are in Australia. We liberals are our Republicans, so it's. You know, I don't know why we do that, but that's what it is. So he was a conservative, um, so of course he had to shoot it down. Um, but yeah, the debate was pretty pretty hysterical, um, and that was that little one liner of his sort of just summed up the the level of thought they put into the debate, which was a bit disappointing because we, we've seen that thirty kilometers an hour um, is being adopted in so many places around the world. Yeah, yeah, you no, know, absolutely. And, 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 it and works, as you point so. as you, you point out, um, I think in a, another video, um, yeah, it, twenty is plenty campaign. You know, in in the UK, a little bit here in 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 North America in the United States, um, but yeah, thirty kilometers per hour. You're you're talking about, you know, right around seventeen miles per hour. It's just it's brilliant. It's it's not it. You know, we don't we don't need to like belabor the point that. Um, or maybe we do, <laughs> uh, you know, that it's, it's, it, it's a brilliant speed because you get all the benefits of, from a safety perspective. Um, and, uh, but you know, motorists can still get around, you know, they can get yeah. to their, their destinations, especially the context that we're talking about here of the central business districts, where there's going to be lots of uh, conflicts and lots of other people, and then also residential areas where you're more likely to run into and be come into contact with families, kids. Hmm. Imagine that. I know it's a it's a horrifying yeah. thought, isn't it? Um, yeah. so, and and that was the the idea is that. And it's actually one of the um, policies that the Space for Cycling Brisbane campaign has as one of our six core policies is yeah. 30k an hour local and neighbourhood streets. Yeah. And that's, you know, we have a road hierarchy in, in Brisbane, you know, right up to arterial roads. So local and neighbourhood streets are your local neighbourhood streets. They're not right. the ones that are designed to carry large numbers of vehicles and they're not designed as a fast through route. Right. Um, but, well, those know, are the you, streets that we were highlighting when we were zooming in on the residential streets that, you know, every single one of those streets should have been a dashed green line of exactly. saying that, yeah, they, these should be 30 kilometer per hour zones, you know, throughout. And, you know, there was decent connectivity there. They should mm. all be considered. That's you know, right. And, and you know, and, and for the, from a political perspective, it just makes sense because it's a lot cheaper to just establish that lower speed culture on those local streets than forever having to deal with expensive requests for traffic calming or yeah. um, or separated cycling infrastructure and footpaths and things like that. If, if yeah. you don't need to spend all that money, then that's that's an added advantage. You know, you can well, save I'd like that. See, I'd like to see, uh, you know, both. I mean, I'd like to see. Yeah, for sure. I'd like to see the, the that default speed lowered in these in the con to fit the context of the environment and then also where appropriate have the appropriate design changes to those streets sure. so that it's intuitive that oh this is a slow area mm. and if it's not intuitive then do those lighter quicker cheaper interventions to to help traffic calm and bring the those speeds down yeah. um so 
I love your sense of humor. So we're going to pull up another video here, and we're going to we're going to play the uh, the union of social safe roads. <laughs> USSR. Here we go. Yes. Good Welcome, comrades, to another public. Don't don't do the Russian accent. Welcome comrades to another public broadcast of the Union of Socialist Safe Roads. You may be concerned that our plot to crush capitalism through making our streets safe for our kids to walk and cycle has been foiled by a plucky Lord Mayor of Brisbane. I'm interested to understand how supportive are you of 30 km an hour speed limits in denser inner city neighbourhoods and what additional evidence or information would you want to see in order to consider supporting the trial of generalised 30 km an hour speed limits for local and neighbourhood streets. Never mind that 40Ks has been incredibly successful in improving the safety of the CBD uh, and the safety record has uh, improved significantly. But when you hear a push for 30, what you're hearing, read between the lines, is they really hate motorists and they want to punish them and they want them out of their cars which is Green's policy pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, and so whether it's a... I love that. He's, he's just going to go everywhere around the world. This is what the Greens, we don't have a Greens party here in, in the United States, but I guess he would you know, throw the progressive uh, uh, liberals uh, you know, here in the United States under that same bus. Although they're not even calling for you know, speed limits like that. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, no, it's, it's, it's very interesting. He, he's, he's, he's a contradiction, our Lord Mayor, um, yeah. because when, when he first got appointed Lord Mayor in 2019, the first thing he did was announce a plan for five green bridges. So green bridges are bridges for um, walking, cycling and public transport. Um, okay. Yeah, but but no cars. So that was his, his vision. He was like, we want to, you know, change our city so that people can get around without their cars. And we're like, so, so let me let me ask you this though: those those bridges are um, for multi use paths, and those for are for separated infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. So okay. yeah. Um, that makes a lot more sense to me because I don't see that as a, as a as a, as a disconnect because um, the the sort of the catch is, is that, you know, it's all, everybody loves an off street network of paths, mm. whether they're on the conservative spectrum or, you know, the liberal perspective or, uh, the socialist perspective, <laughs> everybody loves an off street pathway and trail, um, with exception, there's there's obviously an exception to that rule. There's always some people who are just like not in my backyard because I feel like you're the wrong type of people are going to gain access to my backyard and then be able to steal my stuff and take my flat screen TV out on their, you know, $7,000 cargo bike, e-cargo bike. Yeah. But mm. <laughs> yeah, so I, that's not too, too surprising to me that he was yeah. supportive of that, but he is incredibly protective of who he believes is his constituency that keeps him in office, um, the motoring public. Yeah. And, and that was um, even more obvious with the, uh, um, when we had earlier this year, the, the floods that, um, you know, really took a big toll on Brisbane. We had, I think over three days, we had just about our annual rainfall, annual annual rainfall, so average rainfall. So it was a pretty big disaster and it, you know, wiped out a lot of bike infrastructure because, again, trying to keep things off the road, most of Brisbane's bike network runs along creek beds and or creek banks and river banks. So it's places where they can't develop and they can't build roads. So let's just put, you know, shared paths along creeks, which then got washed away. And so then to fund that recovery, the first thing that he cancelled was an on-road cycleway in North Brisbane, which would have completed, would have ended up completing a, a connection from Brisbane City to Redcliffe, which is about a 60 kilometre um, route. So we've now just got this 500 metre gap, which they've now cancelled plans to to complete. Hmm. And um, just because which, it's an on-road connector. Yeah. yeah, so it would have taken, or would have, you know, repurposed some of the road space away from, you know, 
informal car parking to actually having a cycleway. Let me ask you this about your your river here, because you said it was not just the river, but also the creeks and and some of the other places. So I'm kind of scanning and I'm seeing that, yeah, some of these other pathways are probably tributaries that are then dumping into this river. Is that about right? Yeah, especially if you look um, a bit further north. Um, so if you, oh, if yeah. you see that one that's sort of jiggling and yep. wiggling along towards the west there, that's the uh, Inogra Creek and Ithaca Creek bikeways yeah. which stretch to the gap. So if, if anyone asks you, you know, how do I get from the gap there, which is on the, the far left, yeah. um, into the city, well, yep. well, right along that. Yeah, right, loop, right along that. Yeah. Us, yeah. Yeah. Don't go on the main roads. You know that's going to hold people up. Right, right. <laughs> you know, even though that would be the most direct route, and yeah. um, and also it, yeah. it's a safe, it's a perceived, perceptibly safer route. You know, you know, I, I know from talking to a lot of women mm-hmm. that they're very uncomfortable riding on those um, creekside dark bikeways through parks and things that, that aren't well lit. Right at yeah. night, you if know, they're done, um, if they're done well. They can be, you know, just incredibly inviting in environments because you're getting away from the the motor vehicle exhaust and noise and the potential conflicts. But mm. again, you have to do them well. That's right. If if they're not well lit and you feel like you're very, yeah. you know, alone vulnerable. and isolated, yeah, you, you're going to be vulnerable. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's what I sort of call fair weather infrastructure. It's yeah. really good when the weather's good and the you know it's light. But then, as we saw with the flood, the the rainfall, like all yeah. those creeks flooded really badly, and so I'm then pulling, all those. I'm in, pulling like, out here because I want to get a little bit of the topography going. Because one of the very first things that I saw when I was doing research on on Brisbane was was that it was identified as being essentially in a floodplain, mm-hmm. and it was basically the the description was it's a river with a city problem. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a. A book that's been um, written, so sort of looking into the history of our river, and and it yeah. has, you know, the the early early well colonizers, we'll call them, um, in Brisbane that, you know, they they set up, or established Brisbane, and the the indigenous people at the time said, you shouldn't yeah. build there, yeah, if it's a it'll it'll flood, and they're like, yeah. oh. and now you've got and, then and now you have two point seven million people in in that basin. <laughs> yeah, and, and and you know, and and you know, t- 2011 it flooded, um, yeah. and now again 2022, and it's going to happen more frequently as we know as as climate yeah. change um, continues. So there's now very expensive programs to try and buy back some of that land that's been built on where it floods consistently, yeah. and then convert that to green space. But you know, it's a very expensive and and slow process, and um, yeah. you know, we, we've already we've already got predictions of another La Nina. Well, there isn't another La Nina happening and that usually coincides with heavier rainfall. So, right. you know, we've got we've got a city that's already feeling flood anxiety um, right. and now we're going in, into a summer and we're just, there's, there's a real sense of anxiety amongst people. So, yeah. you know, ho- hopefully it won't happen, but, you know, we're we're getting a bit weary of all these um, these flood disasters. And you guys are sort of in a sub subtropical sort of uh, environment there, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, you know, we occasionally get tropical cyclones come down this yeah. way as well. That's that's often or has traditionally been a, um, a cause of flooding. Um, the 1974 floods was caused by a low-grade tropical cyclone that crossed the coast and dumped a lot of rain very quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, that was before we had our Wyvernhoe Dam, which, again, didn't save us in 2011. So, so yeah, we're, we're in an area where you've got, you know, like there's the mountain mountainous areas to the west, and then right. it's, you know Brisbane itself is on a floodplain that opens out into Moreton Bay. We're in a subtropical, you know, the southern end of the Coral Sea, so we do occasionally get tropical storms, um, and we also get extra tro- extra tropical storms quite often. We call them East Coast lows. So right, right. you know, and then when we're not having huge flooding events, we get really gnarly thunderstorms as well. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> they roll in from. From because the one of the one style. of the things that uh, you know around the the globe we hear about the disastrous um, wildfires and the droughts uh, that the rest of the, the the country you know really uh, gets impacted by and and is, suffers from um, and uh, yeah so it's it all depends on where you're at it's a very big country 
That's right. And then the the you know what what shows up when we have these disasters is just how fragile yeah. our transport systems are. You know, um, during during the floods, obviously bikeways all went underwater and were were damaged. So cycling then yeah. was pushed back onto roads, and that was a pretty scary experience on a lot of those roads because. Again, drive, drivers quite happy with with cyclists being off the road and out of sight, out of mind. Now right. suddenly we were we're on there sharing the roads, or I hate that term, but we were using the roads as we were able to do because they're there for all people to use. Yeah. But yeah, they weren't going to give you any more space. It was sort of like, well, no, we're gonna we're gonna run not run you down, but we're we're not going to treat you any any more kindly. Yeah. Um, Although we had a little bit of. A development in the, in that uh, arena. So, yeah. uh, so what's what's the setup to what we're going to see here? Yeah. So this is a picture of um, what used to be Drift Restaurant. So it, it was a floating, well, it was sort of built in the river restaurant um, alongside the Bicentennial Bikeway. Uh, in 2011, a big chunk of it broke free and floated away and the rest of the the restaurant was destroyed and unfortunately for the for the owners of it they couldn't resurrect it so it just sat there derelict next to the river for the next decade mm. and then the flood this year moved the rest of it and it ended up on top of the bikeway um as you can <laughs> see there so, so that's massive that, so this is the bikeway being blocked by this derelict restaurant that you know basically was just a barge kind of sitting out in the water and the the floods did it so let's let's yeah. press play on this and and uh we'll we'll see uh what what happened because encouragingly there was a little bit of a solution to the block the blocked bike path In part one of the Bicentennial Bikeway Saga, I covered the Drift Restaurant disaster and the campaign to use a lane of Coronation Drive as a temporary detour. We will be closing uh, a general traffic lane along Coronation Drive, so we're closing um, that to, to vehicle traffic in order to create a protected uh, off-road, bi-directional um, bicycle lane so that we can replace what was lost. Did Brisbane City Council follow through and create that temporary two-way cycleway? And how's it worked? Did it cause traffic chaos like some media were predicting? Well, I headed along a few times this week to check it out. Let's have a look. So it's a bit of a wet day today, but it's the opening of a protected bike lane on Coronation Drive while the Drift Restaurant's being removed. So despite the rain, I've seen quite a few cyclists going through here. You can see that there's still five lanes of vehicle traffic. Uh, it's moving just as well as it normally does at this time of day. It's about eight o'clock in the morning. So I think council's done a really good job. So as you come up off Lane Parade, come across the existing narrowish or shared path, and then just where the bus stop used to be. There's a ramp, head down onto the bikeway, and you've got a nice uninterrupted run through to Graham Street. Bike lane. Oh. <laughs> People are still working it out. <laughs> I love it. And you're, now you get the, the view here. Hallelujah. 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 I love it. That's great. Um, so that, that was encouragement. Now, was that quite the fight to get that in there? I mean, is that kind of the, the, the backstory? Because obviously, yeah, you were forced into the lane and you were, you know, people who were riding bikes were forced to deal with trying to control a lane. And, and of course, I mean, that was, that's six lanes of traffic. There? Mm. Yeah. And it's a 60 kilometer an hour road as well. Um, and we, we know buses, trucks, it's a major route. And, yeah. um, you know, so, so I did have to push really hard cause I was like, I was really concerned that, you know, 
there'd be two outcomes. One would be that people would just not ride until it was right. repaired, and I didn't didn't know how long that was going to be. And two was my more bigger concern was that people were going to get hurt, you know, right. because they're either, they're either going to ride on the road and. No, you and said you it. were pushing. Is it you and your your organization? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, myself, um, West Bug Space Cycling. We really ramped up some pressure on it. Got it. Um, Got it. So it was about it was about you know well, a few days after the the floods had subsided and we'd seen the damage that I I wrote to them and said hey can we look at doing a temporary bike lane between Lane Parade and Graham Street or ideally all the way. Yeah. Um, towards Crib Street, which is a bit further along. Um, and I, you know, drew lines on a map and, you know, this is how it could work, close this turning lane or whatever. Um, but the original response was just no. Um, I, I went on local radio to try and plead the case a bit, um, but I got, again, got told no. But eventually there was a, a change of heart. And I think, I, I don't know, I just kept pushing. <laughs> I was how like, many, I was going to. How many weeks of, of this did it take? Um, I think from memory it was about three weeks, I think, okay. back and forward. Um, okay. They're like, this guy's not going away. No. And and (laughs) there's another um, community group uh, called Turnstile um, Community Bike Shed. They they sort of, they're not, you know, a free um, cooperative that, you know, people can just bring their bikes along and they can work work on bikes, get taught how to fix and that kind of thing. But they sort of took on the cause and they they had um, like one of their, on their, their bike day where they had people come over, they actually drew, drew up signs, you know, you know, to, to tell motorists, you know, there's cyclists here, look out for cyclists because there's no bike way, you know, because it was a bit of a, you know, again, the bike way is right there, but it's down below road level. So I think right. unless a lot of people probably don't even know it's there and they would possibly not know that it was blocked. And so then suddenly you've got cyclists on the road and there were, there were just people that weren't, I suppose, caring. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it, it was a good outcome. The, the council you know, gave me a call and said, or the councillor Murphy gave me a call and said, oh, look, we are going to put that bike lane and I wanted to let you know. I'm like, oh, wow. Wow. Fantastic. So, yeah. so that um, kind of c- caught you by surprise. It wasn't like, you know, you were able to like feel like you had uh, a champion in there and, and you, you had some hope and it just kind of like surprised the heck out of you. Yeah, pretty, pretty much. I mean, I, I know a few people that, that work in there and they were, they were sort of like, you know, keep pushing, keep pushing because right, right, um, right. okay. they, they, were, they were trying to push internally as well. Yeah, but, yeah, you yeah. know, obviously it, it, you need someone who has the political clout right. to, to make that call. I think that's um, a really good point that you just made there too, is that oftentimes, uh, you know, these councillors and city council members and even in the mayor, oftentimes that they have other people who are within their organisations who are like, they see it, they get it. And they're, they're like working it from the inside. And, and it's like, yeah, seriously, keep, keep your pressure, keep it going. We're, we're, we're working, we're, you know, quietly working it from this angle too. So I, I think yeah. it's, it's easy for us to just get frustrated and say, oh, there's no damn politicians, da, 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 da. But oftentimes, you know, having, relationships with some of their advisors and some of their uh, staff that are, you know, working things like, you know, policy side and, and other, you know, it, it, I think it's incredibly important. Mm, absolutely. Um, and another example of that was actually, you know, Space for Cycling has been pushing for a um, CBD grid of protected bike lanes. So right. through, our, through our city centre, and we've been pushing for that since we sort of started our campaign in 2015. And in fact, at the time we had the largest ever online petition with Brisbane City Council. We had something like um, two and a half thousand signatures asking for it and we were told no. But we, we kept getting the message from within, you know, people that within council saying, keep pushing, you yeah, know, yeah. And, and within Department of Transport, keep pushing. And then during COVID, they announced, you know, like a lot of cities around the world did, putting up, you know, pop-up bike lanes that they would put a temporary or a, a what, how do they describe it? Basically a, a, a permanent temporary. <laughs> sort of like um, an interim sort of thing. Yeah, yeah an interim solution, yeah, yeah, basically. So on Elizabeth Street and Edward Street in the city. So, and, that, and that's been fantastic. So that was a, you know, that was an example, I think, where, you know, we've been pushing a lot from the outside, it's been pushing from inside and eventually all the, all the, the ducks lined up and it, and it, you know, was the right time and it, and it happened. So, um, yes, now we just want to see it expand. Obviously, it's just it's just two streets in the city at the moment, but um, which um, is very small part of the the inner city. But but yeah, it's 
it's sort of why I do what I do and why I keep putting up with it because you do yeah. you do it does seem like you're just going nowhere for a long yeah. time. Well, it's really it's really great too when you're able to get some other organizations that you know will also chime in and say no no seriously this this is actually something that we need to be doing like for instance with the the speeds you know if we can if we can bring those speed limits down this is going to be safer for everybody it's going to be safer for people walking it's going to be safer for people biking it's going to be safer for people driving and so i i like to emphasize with folks that the bigger we can make our tent you know, get as many organizations, public health groups, uh, disability groups, more people, the better, because then it doesn't feel like it's just the cyclists, hmm. the silo of a specialist group. It's like, no, this is good for everybody, including hmm. the business district. By the way, this is, you know, this will mean more money for businesses if you have streets that are suddenly, you know, like actually people oriented people want to be there <laughs> so yeah 100% but yeah. it's 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 funny you still have the the arguments against um you know on, on road bike lanes to say oh well you, if you take away parking you're going to hurt businesses but you know all the evidence is that the opposite is true but um yeah. for a lot of people until they experience it they don't believe it um right. and it's that it's that um that notion that value-based messaging is what works. You know, pe people aren't going to listen to facts and figures and no, no, and it's, it's got to be story. It's got to be storytelling, and it's got to yeah. be uh, be for them to be able to actually see it themselves. And that's mm. where the these interim solutions and these pop up and tactical urbanism becomes so powerful because then it's like, oh wow, I can totally see that how this could mean more business for my business. And, and, and this is a good thing. And that's the other reason why I, I, I really emphasize that, that fact of being a conspicuous consumer and, and let hmm. these business owners and restaurateurs know that, yeah, I, I rode my bike here. I'm not dressed up like I rode my bike here and I'm not carrying my helmet, but I, I yeah, I really appreciate that bike rack out front. Thanks. Yeah. You know, that was huge. And, uh, and, and because that reinforces a little bit of that bikes do mean business and people walking to businesses mean business. And it's, it's not the, it's, it's not that assumption that they have that all 110% of my people who walk through the door got there by car, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. It's, it's really good. Chris, we're running out of time here. What <laughs> final little nugget of wisdom uh, from the other side of the world would you like to uh, leave the audience with? Oh, now you, you've thrown me in it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I, I think, you know, everyone likes to think Australia is unique. You know, we, we have a, we are, you know, we're this island continent, you know, bottom of the planet. You know, we, if it feels like it's sort of, it might as well be in another another galaxy. But you know, what we, you know, our cities are really just cities. They were no different to anyone else. Um, you know, there was a um, an author named Donald Horn who, you know, we, we've got this. Um, sorry, there's a there's a a phrase associated with Australia called the lucky country, okay. and it's sort of used. It's it's used kind of wrongly as a term of endearment. So the author, it was writ, writ, coined by a man named Donald Horn. And um, the full quote is actually that Australia is a lucky country run mainly by second rate people who share its luck. It lives on other people's ideas. And although it's ordinary people are adaptable, most of its leaders so lack curiosity about the events that surround them that they are often taken by surprise. So that really resonates with the struggle that we sort of have with our cities is that, you know, the, these ideas aren't new, you know, they're not, terribly you know groundbreaking you know we're asking for um you know groundbreaking um changes in, in in our community fabric it's stuff that's been done and it's been proven yeah um we just need some of those uh politicians that are leading us to be a bit less second rate um but i think the, the only way to get that is that if people are asking for it and i yeah. think um one of the the side effects of our um, you know, she'll be right, mate, kind of attitude in Australia is that we just accept what it is and we yeah. don't 
as a as a community, we don't generally ask for better. Yeah. Um, so sorry, I'm rambling a bit, but I, I think I guess that's my message is that you know there's advocates that are out there that are that are pushing, but you know it's the people that just ride their bike to go to the shops, right. do little bits and pieces, or who want to, they kind of need to speak up. They need yeah. to, you know, even if it's just telling their friends, but they need to be. I mean, it needs to be shown that it's not just us ad- advocates and advocate ad- yeah. advocates and activists that are always in the in the media or in the spotlight. You know, yeah. the you know we, we can get polarized as, a, as these little um, outliers, but you know. Anyway, I don't know if that's really summed up anything very well at all. Um. <laughs> well, and what's really interesting to me too is that you know, the last time I checked, uh, I don't think Australia is a great oil producing company or country continent. No, but we we produce a lot of um, lot of nat- natural gas. That's our big thing. But okay. you, but you're right. You know, we, we don't produce a lot of our own oil, so we are very oil dependent. So yeah. our transport system is very much dependent on um, importing oil. Okay. Uh, and, and and petrol um you know there's a big push for electric vehicles as there is in a lot of parts of the world but right. you know our, our, our cities don't have necessarily a fuel problem we have a geometry problem you know you can only cram so many cars in yeah um and at the moment we've got 85 percent of all trips in brisbane are taken by car yeah. if our population keeps growing the way it is that there's nothing you can do that's going to make that work so yeah. Yeah. The, we have to be pushing to drive less and make it so that people can drive less. Yeah, and 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 as we emphasized earlier, we have a climate issue <laughs> as well. 100%. So I mean, and that's and you know, you, certainly the extremes that uh, you all are feeling down there uh, are quite devastating. So um, I think that that's one of the overarching um, themes that uh, has really sort of come to a head over the last couple of years anyways during my conversations is that we need to be moving forward with a sense of urgency and Hmm. if the politicians are not following up their rhetoric with action they need to be voted out Hmm. and uh, and that's exactly what the lord mayor said well it's a democracy. You can vote me out. And so that would be my closing message, uh, you know, of this episode is uh, once again, um, you know, get engaged at the block level, at the neighborhood level, at the community level, and make sure that you are going out there voting. Uh, and if good people aren't running, run for office. <laughs> and you did. So you're, 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 my, you're, you're my second uh, uh, guest on the podcast uh, who uh, ran for office, didn't win, but uh, is, uh, is dedicated and, and is going at it, trying to, to do the right thing. And uh, it's been such an honor and such a pleasure uh, chatting with you here, Chris. Thank you for, so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. No, thanks very much, John. It's been great. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Chris Cox. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up. (laughs) Leave a comment down below and uh, share it with a friend. And if you haven't already done so, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just hit that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell right next to it uh, so that you can customize your notification preferences. I'll be back next week with another episode. So until then, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. Also sending out a very big thank you to all my amazing Active Towns ambassadors who are directly supporting my efforts through Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, the YouTube Super Chats and Super Thanks, as well as buying things from the Active Towns store and making donations to the nonprofit. Every little bit helps and is greatly appreciated. Thank you all so very much.